Merce, welcome to your first episode of Off Script. How are you keeping? Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, good. Good. Bit up and down, but yeah, can't moan. Throughout the years, we've spoken to you at length about your triumphs and your problems in football. But we want to delve into your experiences playing alongside some of the biggest characters in the game throughout your career. Now, if we go back to the start, where it all began for you, the mid-80s, your breakthrough at Arsenal, your breakthrough thought coincided with George Graham's reign at Highbury. Um, you don't have to look too far for proof that, that he was one of the biggest characters and personalities of his age as the manager. As an 18-year-old, was that a baptism of fire working under him? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was petrifying, if I'm being honest. He, he, he ruled with an iron rod. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and he was, he was someone that I don't think in this day and age, with players on 100 grand a week, he would get very far. But for me, he was... He was the best manager I ever worked under. There's no doubt about that. I don't think we'd have won anything at Arsenal without Jules Graham. So, yeah, he was, it was an experience. You know, people used to call me son of. They thought he was, he was, I was his son because I'd, I'd get away with so much. But, yeah, he was, he was a great coach. And I've, I mean, if you look back, Jack, I mean, Dave Seaman does stuff on Talk Sport. Nigel Winterburn does stuff. Steve Bowles been the, man, man, been the coach at Arsenal. Tony Adams been a manager. Uh, Lee Dixon works on uh, in American TV. Perry Groves works on the radio. You know, I, I work I work on Sky. Alan Smith works on Sky. Ian Wright works on the telly. So that tells you all them players all learnt the game off of Jules Graham. We all learnt the game, and and that's why we've all gone on and gone into TV and radio because of the knowledge of the game. I, I would I would have said so. That just shows you how, how good he was, George Graham. He learnt us all the game. You said he ruled with an iron fist. Um, what, how big a role did that sort of authoritarian introduction into top flight football, your first experience of top flight football under his like, tuition, how did that mould you into the, the player you became? Uh, I had to become very disciplined. I mean, it was all about working without the ball. Uh, before it was... You know, I like playing football, but it was what you had when you didn't have the ball. And it, it was hard. It was Everybody knew what they were going to do, though. You know, I, I knew in, say, 1990, on a Tuesday, I could tell you what I was going to be doing in, on, in 1992 on a Tuesday. And that's what it was like. That was what it was like. It was very regimental, bang, bang, bang. Everything was the same. Everything was the same week in, week out. So it become like when we walked on that football pitch, it was the equivalent of getting up in the morning and you clean your teeth. You just do it. You do it. You don't think about cleaning your teeth. And that was what it was like on the football pitch. It was ingrained into us what, exactly what we had to do, exactly what position we had to be in when we didn't have the ball. It was, that's what it was like. What was it like then if you... There must have been some strong or harsh lessons when you didn't follow those instructions to begin with? What was that oh. like the receiving end of a Graham grilling, should we call it? i tell you what, we used to do a thing in, in training where you had groups of uh, six. So one group of six would be in the middle, group of six in each other square. So two people would have to go in and try and get the ball. You had to make four passes and then chip it over the middle part and then two would go in. But if you look, all it was for was if you lost the ball, you had to react as quickly as you can and get into the other half to close the ball down. And I lost the ball once and I jogged. And he went, start moving, and I laughed. That's all <laughs> I did, I laughed. And I never played for two months. I never played for two months. Never said a word. Never pulled me in and said anything. The team sheet went up and I never played again for two months. And that's, that's how hard he was. As simple as that. Simple as that. You don't do it. That's it. You're not playing. So almost sort of soft power sort of approach to things. No, no, he wasn't. You know, he just, he was, he just, he'd done it by, you know, he, he'd never, he never really had a go at me, if I'm being honest. If, if, you know, the lads would always say, I mean, you know, I was, we was, we was in, where was we? We went and played in Miami when we won the league and then we come back, we had to play Man United, didn't we? And lost 4-1 at Old Trafford. But we went to Miami to play Independiente and it was boiling hot in Miami and, we were just we were just training. I stood there and I was just rubbing my groin. Just you know what I mean. You know what you're doing. You're just rubbing it. And he went, "You're right. You're right." I went, yeah. He went, "Just sit out. Just sit out." 
and I had the lad slaughter me, so I just sat out on Sunday for the next hour. But yeah, it was weird. He he, he looked after me, the boss. I mean, I, I I still call him the boss today. If he walked in, into any room, I'd call him the boss. That's how much respect I have for the man. You won all of your honours at Arsenal. Under yeah. Jordan, and then he left. I did a win a table. Te- I did win a table tennis competition at uh, Warner's Holiday Camp as well. <laughs> after that, fair play. <laughs> Is that on your mantelpiece now? No, no, no. I take it off. Take it off. Put my league medals in. <laughs> Following on from George Graham was obviously an unenviable task as Bruce Rio. Yeah. One season he had there, and then there was all uncertainty at the start of the '95. 95- 96-7 season, and then Arsene Wenger finally got appointed. Um, as a player, did his arrival come as like a welcome relief, or what, what were your initial impressions when you first laid eyes on him? Wow. What, what's happened here? I mean, I remember David Dean, we had a big canteen. I don't know if you've been to Watford's training ground, but we used to train at Watford's training ground next door to the new Arsenal one, and we had a big canteen, and I remember David Dean coming in, the day before, and saying we, we, we've just taken a, a manager on called Arsene Wenger from a, from a, a Japanese club, Krampus Say, was it? Did I say that right? Yeah. Yeah, wow. Uh, so, he, he's, and then we was like, wow. And he come in, he was like Inspector Clouseau. He talked like Inspector Clouseau. It was, you know, it was, it was so different. But after about a week, I remember all the lads couldn't wait to get into training. We used to have to be in at 10 o'clock in the morning to start training at half 10 and people used to come in at 5 to 10. You know, just get yeah. changed and, then, and that was it. Because we all knew what we were going to be doing. But when, when Arsene Wenger come in within a week, the lads couldn't wait to get into training. And I think it, it was just phenomenal training. It was everything was thinking, you know. Every, there was no running. You didn't have to run without the ball. It weren't anything like that. It was all football. One and two touch. If you took two touch, you had to make sure the next ball was played forward. And it was a thinking man's game. And I couldn't talk highly enough of the man. I, I thought he was, he was so far ahead of his time, it was scary. So there was initial doubts to begin with when you first oh, saw him? Oh, 100%. And then what was that first moment where you thought, he means business, this guy? I, just, just how enjoyable it was. It was it, we, as I said, we all knew what we was going to be doing week in, week out. But and then when he come in, it was everything was so different. It, you know, you got to remember it was to the training we were doing, to the training we started doing with Arsenal was was all new. And if you look, it, it just put so many years on players' careers. Do you know what I mean? He, I yeah. wasn't drinking at the time, and he he took the drink out of the players' lounge. You know that had gone. He said to players, you know, if you drink, you're not going to recover from injuries so quickly. And it, it, he, he was he was absolutely brilliant. Honestly, he was attack minded. It was more about attacking than, than defending when, be, when before it was about defending and not attacking. But yeah, he was. It, I always look back now and I always thought if George Graham had Arsene Wenger's attacking now and Arsene Wenger had George Graham's defending now, I think Arsenal would have won the league for, for 15 years. I think they would have dominated football. It's well documented about Wenger's sort of the revolutionary force he had at Arsenal in the Premier League, but was his biggest task perhaps changing the culture at Arsenal after that? Good George Graham. Oh, 100%. 100%. I, don't, I don't think he, he didn't change it in enough where, you know, everybody stopped, they, every, all the lads stopped drinking and, and they, they never went out, but they had the right time to, to, to stop. And I think when, when he was bringing in the quality of players like Petit and Overmars and and Thierry Henry and Perez, I think that rubbed off on the English players as well. And I think it helped the, the foreign players coming in, watching the English players help them as well, because it's a different different dressing room. You know, when there's like English players, it's laughy, jokey, and not as serious as when the foreign players come in. And I think when they both, I think both of them helped each other, I think, and they become a team that, you know, I don't care what anybody says. People keep on going at me. Oh, yeah, they they went the whole season without de- defeated, but they didn't get the points that sound so got. Believe me, if you're going to win the league, yeah. win the league, not losing a game. I don't care if you get 100 points. Don't lose a game. Because at the end of the day, that's what we all start out to do, is not to lose a football match. And if you don't lose a 
to go the whole season. I don't care. That would never be done again. Yeah. You moved uh, to Middlesbrough and what is now the Championship in 97. Yeah. Some characters at Riverside back in those days. Brian Robson wow. was manager. Paul Gascoigne, Nigel Pearson, Ravinelli were teammates. Emerson. Uh, before we yeah. get to, uh, yeah, Emerson. Before we get to them, though, characters surely don't come much bigger than your brother who moved up with you up to the North East. How did he secure that gig? Yeah, my brother, he, he was a... Uh, my wife wouldn't move up at the time. My wife wouldn't move up. She said, no, we're, we're Londoners. The kids are happy at school. And, you know, I, I signed. I, I just couldn't turn the money down. The money was, it was ridiculous at the time. I mean, when I come back and I talked to Arsene and, and said bye to the lads, he said... How did you get on? And I told him, and he said, I'm not even giving Dennis Burkett what you're getting. And I wasn't even playing in the Premier League. I mean, that's how, I, I, that's what I, that's how great a deal it was. You know, you're talking one of the best players ever to play football was it getting as much. And, yeah, I just, I, I hadn't been, I was travelling up all the time. I was travelling up every day. Every day I was travelling up and coming home. I just couldn't stay up there. I was struggling for form. I mean, my debut, everybody has a good debut. Oh, my God, my debut was four out of ten. <laughs> oh, against Charlton, we won two one, but I was atrocious. I mean, the lads used to say to me, "We signed his brother." I mean, that's how bad I was at the start. And then they that's did. How, that's <laughs> how they, they used to take the Mickey. I mean, Bib used to. Bib was the coach, who's a great lad. He used to go, "Oh my God, we 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 we've signed Mercy's brother." Eh? You know, it was literally I was that bad at the start. Was that because you were on, you were unsettled with commuting up, almost up to the north? I mean, yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, it was. Uh, being unsettled was a part of it and, and travelling, my back was hurting. And you've got to remember, this might sound a bit weird, but the Championship's 100 times harder than the Premier League. <laughs> it's 100 times harder. In the Premier League, you get time on the ball, you're playing with a better quality of player, time on the ball. In the Championship, it is 100 mile an hour for every single football match. You know, you get the ball, you, you put your head up and there's two people around you, one in a tackle you and and everybody's wanting to get into that Premier League. Yeah. And it, it, it's so much, I found it so much harder. I mean, when you got into a good team and we started playing, and then it became a bit of a doddle. But at the start, you know, I'm always one of them people, well, you're only as good as the players around you. If you ain't got the players around you, it's, you, you you're never going to do it on your own unless you're playing snooker, tennis, or golf. But when you're playing football, you need players around you. And when my brother moved up, he, he moved up, he, yeah. He, I said to the club, I'm struggling. They said, well, you need to move up. And my brother come in and uh, he went up for a meeting with them and they, they put him on the wage bill. <laughs> Literally put him on the wage bill. His job was to sit and watch telly with me. Sit and watch telly with me. They gave him 400 quid a week. How, how did he get on? Seven out of 10 every week? Oh, he loved it. Absolutely yeah. loved it. He loved it, but it changed my game. You know, I was more comfortable. I was happy. Yeah. And then I started flying. He couldn't stop, you know, couldn't stop winning football matches. And it was it was it was good. My brother was a bit devastated when I left. If I'm being honest, <laughs> he had the job of a lifetime. But yeah, it was it was good. But we weren't we, we were a very good team. But we 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 went for a little run and we 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 won. We got into the cup final, the league cup final, which we beat Liverpool over two legs. I mean, you're talking Steve McManaman, and Jamie Redknapp, uh, Michael Owen. You know that Liverpool team. Yeah. Yeah. You know and to beat them over two legs when we're a championship team was phenomenal but I remember uh, Brian Robson coming calling me in his office with about six games to go and he went you can go on holiday for a couple of weeks I said what he went you can go on holiday for a couple of weeks we've got six games to go we, we were third in the league at the time it was uh, Forrest and Sunderland then us and we, we were still everybody was sort of beating everybody everybody was winning them games then do you know what I mean you couldn't see anybody losing and he said go away for a for a couple of weeks, recharge your batteries and you'll be ready for the playoffs. And I was like, we've got six games to go. We can win these six. If we win these six, you never know. And he went, and I went, no, no, I'll stay. I'll stay. And we, we ended up winning all, we, we ended up, I think we won five and drew one. And Sunderland got, I think they dropped points at home to QPR. And we ended up going up in the end on the last day of the season. But I could have gone on holiday for a couple of weeks. And then it wouldn't have happened. It, well, we, we, maybe <laughs> we'd have won the playoffs, but, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, that was a, a, a major thing for me was to get promoted. I mean, they got they struggled the year before Jorginho had left. And, but Brian Robson, who I think is a legend, to ring me up and say, I want you to come and take his place was, was a big thing. And it, it was hard at first because everybody loved Jorginho. You know, the fans loved him. And for me to go up and take his place was, 
was hard at the start. It was hard. With Brian Robson, when you were growing up as a kid, learning your trade, was he a player you idolised? And what was it like, like you said, to get that call? Brian Robson putting that faith in you. And your games are very similar in certain aspects. Did he? Yeah, we're both fathers now. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're both like a tackle. Yeah, <laughs> both like a tackle. Yeah, I mean, if my arm fell out of the socket, I'd carry on as well. Yeah, of course yeah. I would. Yeah. No. Uh, did his yeah, methods, I mean, did, did his he methods wasn't, he wasn't a what's name. He wasn't, it, I didn't idolise him. I just, you know, when I was a kid, you know, you always thought, oh my God, this this man would run for a brick wall for you. He was in England International. Yeah. You know, he was, he, but I, I, he, was, he was someone that I just, you know, when someone rings you up and goes, oh, you're a good player. You know, I just want to ring my dad up and tell my dad, Brian Robson thinks I'm a good player, dad. You know, and, that, and I was like 30 years of age at the time. Yeah, yeah. For someone to come with that quality and say, I want, I want to buy you. I mean, I don't think people realise how much a lift that gives you when you've got someone like of that, of that magnitude, that stature to say, oh, you know, I think you're a top player. You know, and it, it was, he was a different coach. He was completely different to George Graham and to, to Arsene Wenger. I thought he'd be like, bang, bang, you know, like the way he played. And he, he wasn't like that at all. He was very, very laid back, very laid back. So in your dressing room, you've got the likes of Pearson, Ravinelli, yeah. Azar. You must have some dressing room tales from that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, well, he summed it up. I mean, I, I, I played with a lad called Fester who played centre-half. Italian yeah. lad, Fester. And we played York City away in a pre-season friendly. And we come in at half-time and we're sitting there and, and it wasn't great. And Brian was having a bit of a go and someone's phone went. And I thought, Oh my God, they're in trouble here. And it was Fester's phone. And he, he literally got up, he got his phone out of his pocket. He started talking in Italian for like 30 seconds. I thought, the manager's going to rip your head off here. I mean, this is Brian Robson. I mean, I watched how he played. He's gonna, and he, he just, he went over and he put the phone back in his pocket and sat back down. And, and Brian never said a word. And I was like, and I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh my God, I've just come from Arsenal here. You know, where you ain't playing for like two months, if that. You're, you're, you're just not playing. And he, he just carried on. And, it, you know, Nigel Pearson was the one for me. He was, you could always say he was going to be, everybody's petrified of Nigel. Everybody, <laughs> he was the one. He was the one. Nigel was the one. You know, everybody's petrified of him. And he was a great captain. I mean, and, he, and you could see how he was going to go on and be a successful manager. No doubt about that. His, his skin was very thick. He didn't care who he upset. But he was just—he was just a great, a great, great lad. You couldn't talk highly enough for the bloke. I was gonna—I was gonna ask, like, did Brian Robson have a job keeping the lid on what, on paper, looks a lively dressing room? But he, from what you're saying there, he had a—he sort of had he, a different approach to it. Yeah, no, he had—he he had Nigel. He, I, I think every top manager needs needs like another voice up. in the. Yeah. Needs another voice. I mean, people get fed up. You know, you see last week when. Mourinho said about Song and Luis, he went, oh, it's brilliant. Loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you want as a manager. You don't want to keep on coming in every week with the same voice. The players get the ump in the end. They, they, they get yeah. that, oh, here we go. The manager's moaning again. You, what you want is a Tony Adams or a John Terry or a Roy Keane or a Nigel Pearson that's going to come in and pick a couple of players out before the manager even opens his mouth. And I think that, that was a massive help to Brian. I think Nigel being there was was massive. You know, he was coming towards the end of his career, but he didn't care who he picked out. There's no doubt about that. So after that season at Middlesbrough, you were named in the England squad for the 98 World Cup. Yeah. brings us on nicely to one of your other managers now, Ian Glenn Hoddle. Many at the time thought his methods were unorthodox, but you've been quite vocal about how good a coach he was. Would you say he was ahead of his time? Yeah, well, he worked under Arsene Wenger at Monaco, so he brought a lot of that stuff with him, you know. Yeah. What we were doing at Arsenal without, you know, the stuff we, we used to take and the vitamins and things like that. You know, Glenn had had all that at Monaco. So, I, I thought Glenn was a phenomenal coach. I really did. I thought, you know, I think Terry Venables, you know, to replace Terry Venables, who, you know, is phenomenal as well. And to get Glenn, you know, he was he could have still played. That was the problem. You know, if he, ever, if he could run, he would, but his skill-wise, <coughs> he could still play. And, and for me... Yeah, I couldn't talk highly enough for the bloke. To take me to the World Cup and I'm playing in the Championship, I, can't, I don't think that's ever been done since. So, 
for me, sorry, that no phone's problem. never even gone, ever, ever gone, <laughs> ever. Sorry. That's all right. Can, yeah, so, yeah, for, for him to take me, you know, Tizzle moan that he should have gone instead of me because he was playing in the Premier League, but he weren't. <laughs> What was it? What was that World Cup squad like then, in terms of characters and personalities? Obviously, there was lots of disappointment and some big profile players that weren't taken, and then the squad arrives in France, some big games. Yes, yeah, it's pan out from your point of view. You're inside the camp. Yeah, I mean, first of all, Gaza not going. You know, I mean, I played with him in Middlesbrough. We'd lived together in Middlesbrough. And that, that was a disappointment, you know, with, with him not going. And first of all, you had to get over it with thinking, am I going because Gazza's not going? You know, yeah. and, and that was odd at first. That was that was really odd. But, but yeah, when you went... Attacked. Sorry? Was there any guilt attacked? Uh, not guilt. I mean, because it's not, you know, it's not my, it's not my fault. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it didn't sit comfortable. You start thinking, oh... You know, is it, is it was it me? If I if I didn't go, Gaza would have gone. And you've got to live with that. And then when we went, we had a good we had a good squad. We had yeah. a, a real good squad, and and I, I just thought we had a chance. I I think we did. But people got to remember the World Cup's so difficult. It's, it's so hard to win it. I mean, when I look back on it now, the World Cup, it's you only realise you're at the World Cup when you watch the next year the next four years when you watch it again because you're so far away from everybody you're not it's not like the olympics where you're all in the same hotel you know you literally play the game fly back out a long way away from where you're staying and it's yeah. not it's, and then I, I i hadn't played i didn't play <coughs> the first three games i didn't play i didn't even look like getting on so you're you're training when the players are <coughs> sorry when the players are having a rest and you find you're not really a part of it, but you have to stay fit because you, you just never know what's going to happen. And then against Argentina, you know, David Beckham got sent off and then you're thinking, well, that's the end of my World Cup. And then about 20 minutes to go in the, gate, in the, in the second half, Len turns to me and you're like, wow. And then all of a sudden you're in. And when you start playing, there's nothing like it, the World Cup. You're playing yeah. against the ultimate in the other country. And, you know at home, you know at home, even Tottenham fans want you to do well. <laughs> no, they, they do, and, and that is it. Even Tottenham fans want you to do well. And, and that just shows you that how big a thing it is, how big a thing it is, the World Cup, and playing for your country. Yeah, and when that moment came, slotted a penalty in the shootout, what was that moment like? I would say probably the most nervous I've ever been, really, because... When you're playing in the Premier League or the Championship or, or whatever league, you're playing a game, you get a penalty and you just pick the ball up, everybody gets out of the box, ref blows, bang. When you've got that walk and you're walking from the halfway line down to the to the penalty spot and you've got to you've got the whole country watching and you know because you've been in pubs four years before that and eight years before that and twelve yeah. years before that. And you know everybody is watching and everybody wants you to score. And if you don't score, mm. wow. And he got his, he got his hand to it, the goal in. Lucky enough, it went in. But people go, oh, we missed the trick. We could have won the World Cup. We, we still had to play Holland after that. You still had to play other big countries. So, yeah, yeah, But yeah. it's very rare you go out in the last 16 and come back as heroes. Because there's ways of losing football matches. There's ways of losing football matches. And... And the way we lost was was bang unlucky. So after the World Cup, you moved to Villa. I did. I went back to Middlesbrough first, and I played the first three games in the Premier League for Middlesbrough. First three games I played in the Premier League for Middlesbrough, and then I, I went to, and then Villa coming for me, and I and I, I went to Villa, and it was it, I, Andy Townsend sort of sorted that out. He was at Middlesbrough at the time, and he was taught, he knew John Gregory, and he said Aston Villa. Are interested. I wanted to get back down south. I wanted to get back down south at the time, and it, they were flying at the time. They just started the season. I think they won their first three games at the top of the league, and I went there and again I made my debut against Wimbledon and had a nightmare. But lucky enough, I scored a rebounded penalty that I missed, and and then I, I loved it at Villa. I loved it. I think I played my best football at Aston Villa. I won everything at Arsenal, but that then three or four years at 
at Villa. It took me a while to settle down, but after that was the best football I played. John Gregory was the manager. Who, you get the sense he didn't didn't suffer fools lightly. What was it? What was he like, sort of overseeing that? We didn't. We didn't really. We didn't really get on well at first. If I'm being honest, we didn't really get on well. He signed me, and then after a while, I wouldn't move up. I didn't move up, and we we was in one Sunday. We was in one Sunday. We lost on a Saturday, and I was living down in St Albans still at the time. And he went right. Everybody in Sunday. I was like. Oh. And I come in Sunday, so I went home to London, drove back up Sunday morning. We walked in, he went, everybody get in a bath. We sat in a bath for about 20 minutes. He went, right, everybody go home. And I went and see him. I said, I won't say what I said. But <laughs> there was a couple of swear words in there. And he went, you're supposed to be living 20 miles from the ground. That's in your contract. And, you know, and he was virtually like that. And then that was it. I moved up after that. I moved up, but I... And I was out of the team for a while, and uh, but I, I loved it. I loved it at Villa. I, I, John Gregory was a great manager. I thought he was a great manager. We had a great coach, one of the best coaches I've ever worked under, in Steve Harrison, who I worked with at England. And it and we were. And it clicked. It clicked. It, it did click. I mean, everybody got a bit carried away. We were going to win the league. I'd never yeah. seen that once in my whole time there. You know, when we were top of the league, I remember we played. I was injured, but we played Arsenal. We were two 0 down. We won three two, and I remember we was cut. We went in the next day, and we were warming up. We were doing a warm down, and I, I joined in with the lads, and all the lads going, "Oh my God, we're like, I think we're seven points clear of Arsenal now." We, you know this and that, and I said, "Listen, there's a long way to go." I said, <laughs> "If we if we finish within ten points of Arsenal, we do well," because I know I know what it's like to win a, a, a league. I know what it's like, and it's hard work. It, it's hard. The, it, the last 10 games of a 10 cup finals and then to them, them to 10 cup finals you're playing are all right, ready after you're being jaded as well and you're playing against teams that are fighting and I think we finished 20 odd points behind uh, Arsenal in the end at least 20 points so it just shows you but yeah Villa's a massive club it's a massive football club and, I, and I, honestly I loved it there You played with some big personalities there Yeah Collymore, Bosnich, James, Ginola, Dion Dublin, Hendry, Gareth Southgate. What was that dressing room like? That's a melting pot of... Oh, um, I mean, you have a look at that. I mean, the names you reeled off there, what a team we had. What a team. And God bless him, we had Hugo Egeog, we had Gareth yeah. Barry, who was about 12 years of age, playing <laughs> sweeper. I mean, it was, it was a phenomenal football team. You know, it was a phenomenal football team. You know, we had a great leader in Gareth Southgate. I seriously, I I didn't realise how good a football player Gareth Southgate was until I got to Aston Villa. I think yeah. from a distance you go, oh, he's, he's all right, he's decent. But when you get there, you know he was a leader. He was a he was a leader, not in a leader where he's going to, you know, have people up against the wall and things like that. But he led by example, and he and, and a great professional. I mean, Mark Bosnich. I mean, we used to have these watches on. We years ago we had. Um, a great fitness man called Joe Dunbar who used to train Lennox Lewis. He was one of his fitness coaches. So we had all our heart monitors on and all that. And if you went over a certain amount, you stopped and you didn't work anymore until it went down. And one day we're training and some of the gaffer, John goes, where's Mark Bosnich? I ain't seen him. <laughs> Has anybody seen him? And someone rung him and they had to ring him. So the coach goes back and rings him and goes, and Bozzy answers the phone. Where are you? He said, in bed. He went, what are you doing in bed? He went, well, I got up this morning. My heart rate was too high, so I went back to bed. So that was what he was like. He just went back to bed. But, yeah, we had, we, we had some great players. I mean, Stan Collymore, I mean, should have been the best player in the world. No doubt about that. Should really? have been one of the best, one of, one of the greatest players in the world he should have been. If he was playing today, he would be one of the greatest players in the world. Because everybody knows about mental health now. Everybody yeah. knows about it. No one knew about it then. You know, he was big, he was strong, he was left-footed, right-footed, good in the air, he was quick. I didn't know what else you needed. What he didn't have, he had mental health issues. And no one knew, you know, you'd walk in the dressing room one day and Stan would talk to you for an hour, an hour. The next day you could walk in and go, morning, Stan, and he'd walk through you. He'd walk through you, you think. But no one knew, you just thought, cool, he's arrogant. And that, that wasn't the case. He was, And I think if he was playing today, with what everybody knows, with mental health, 
I think Stan Collie Moore would have been in the top 10 players in the world of football. I really do. That's such, such a shame, that. It, it, it is a shame. Yeah. It is a shame because no one knew. No one knew. No one knew what it was. No one knew what depression was really at the time. And it was hard to talk. You know, as I say, he'd come in one day, he'd be as happy as Larry and he'd be chatting away, he'd talk to you. And, and literally the next day, he, he would walk through you. He would walk through you and it was... And you, you'd look at it like it was arrogance, but it was an arrogance. The, the, the lad was struggling with depression and, and no one knew. And, it, you know, when I look back now, you think, wow, you know, if, 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 if we just knew now what we all know if, then, I, I seriously, I, I don't know who would have been a better footballer than him because he was big, he was strong, he was quick, he could head the ball and he could hit with both feet. And I... I don't know what else you need when you're a footballer. And if, you, if your head's all right on top of that, which you need, because if you ain't, your head ain't all right, you, you ain't playing football. And that, it's a shame. It was a shame. Real shame, yeah. And David, David, I played with David. David, David come to Villa at the end. At the end. He wasn't the David Janola at Newcastle and Tottenham. Every now and then we see it in training when you, like, you just stood there and thought, wow, how good must he have been? Seriously, sometimes he'll get the ball and he'll do that turn where he touches with one foot and goes one way. And you look and you think, he must have been so good, so good. And that, that's the thing. When you get to a certain age, it just becomes that little bit harder to do. And it was a shame because he comes towards the end of his career. But as I say, you always see stuff in training every now and then where you just thought, Wow, and I don't, I don't usually do that with footballers. There ain't too many, but with David, he, he, he had when he done something special. It was a wow. Yeah. Uh, on to Portsmouth now, and Harry Redknapp, who yeah. towards the, the latter years of your career, some was able to get some brilliant performances out of you. What was his secret to man management? Was it purely a man management sort of thing? Oh, 100 percent best man manager I've ever worked under by a million yeah. miles. As a man manager, knowing what you want or what you need, you know, you could tell him what you need. He, he wouldn't tell you what you needed. I think that, that was a massive thing with him. I think but the thing that I get the up with, with, with Harry, people is, oh, he's a wheeler and dealer. What a wheeler and dealer. His knowledge of football is, is, is second to none. I, 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 I honestly think he's, 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 a tact, he's tactically better than Arsene Wenger, in my opinion. In my opinion. You know, I worked under both tactically. If I know a manager who wants to set up, make sure we don't lose a game and stop the other team playing, I'm going to have, you know, for me, Harry's the man. You know, he's like with Jules Graham, you know, that sort of. Arsenal went out, he had unbelievable players. You know, you got Thierry Henry, Dennis Bergkamp, mm -hmm. Perez, Vieira, Petit, you know, people like that, and Overmars and Lundberg. If I'm the manager of Arsenal and I've got them players, I'm opening the football matchup open it up. I want this game to expand and go end to end because if it does, there's only one winner and that's, that's Arsenal because of the players I just reeled off. But when you've got to be a manager who's got, a, hasn't got that quality of player, you've got to set up and that's why I think, I think Harry was a phenomenal manager and he, he put a team together. You know, he put a team together and he went bang, bang, bang and he brought players into certain positions and it clicked. We had, we had, top players again I keep on going back to people go oh you know Mercy he got us promoted you hear Portsmouth I played in a phenomenal football team a phenomenal championship team I, yeah. I mean and I, I'm the first to say I'm no good if I ain't got players around me if I ain't got players around me who are sitting on the, who are on the same wavelength as me who, who are good players and, and I, as we talk about later on when I go to Walsall where it, it all goes wrong so for me I, there were some special players, you know, even Tim Sherwood come, what a player, you know, won the Premier League, centre midfield player. I was with Steve Stone at, at Aston Villa. I mean, nobody wants to win a football match more than Steve Stone. I mean, he, he run through a brick wall for you. And then we had younger players and we had centre-halves. I mean, when I got there, I was talking to Harry and was saying about Limboy Primus. He had no chance of playing. He had no chance of playing. He was a million miles away from playing for Portsmouth again. He played the year before and he got in the team and he was the best player in the team. He was our best player. And it just shows you, you know, strong. we had strong-minded players who, 
who waited and waited and then they got their chance and it was I'm not coming out of the team. And it was it was I mean Yakuba and Todd are off up front. I didn't even have to look. I didn't I got the ball and I went bang and I did, I knew they were gonna be there. And it don't matter how many good balls you put through, they're only good balls if someone scores. Yeah. If they don't score So what you're saying is that no, Every ball you put through was a good one. It just wasn't. Well, no, but it was a good ball, but they've got to finish it. The hardest thing is to score goals. That's why the top players get the top money, the centre forwards, because it's the hardest thing in the world to score goals. I mean, I had my best game I ever played in football in, in my whole life at, at Millwall. We played Millwall away. It was behind closed doors because Millwall and Portsmouth fans don't really get on. And uh, we won 5 0, and Harry brought me off about two minutes before the end. and well, it was, sorry, it was, it was behind closed doors for Portsmouth fans. Millwall fans were allowed to go. And two minutes to go, I got a standing ovation. I walked off and, and that was probably the biggest, biggest thing in my career. Like, biggest individual thing, like, to get a standing ovation at Millwall. Because we know Millwall's like, you know, it's a hard yeah. place to go and play. And What had you done? I, I, sorry? How good a performance was it? I, 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 the best game I ever played. Everything I'd done just just happened. Everything I hit, whatever I hit, it, it went to where it was meant to go. And I just remember afterwards, I, I got out when I left the left the ground. There was a, there was an old man in the car park, and he, he come up to me and he, he said to me, he "Went I've been coming to Millwall for sixty odd years, and I've never seen that before." And I thought, wow. "Wow!" And it was yeah, it was it was a massive thing for me. And since then, I've always looked out for Millwall scores. I've always I've always hoped Neil will do well. Do you know what I mean? Because I got one at Main Road as well when I was playing at Villa, which is it's a massive thing to get when people walk, when you walk off a pitch and people clap you. Oh, I imagine that'd be absolutely yeah incredible. Yeah, hopefully people will be doing the same after this interview I've done with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, just talk us through that promotion season. Then you'd obviously done that before with Middlesbrough. What was different second time round? Did you learn? Anything from the first experience? Uh, I know how hard it is. I when I go when I go into a club and I plan it. Do you know what I mean? I, I know I you know I know every fixture. I know what we got to do. I watch the other teams. Yeah, yeah. We'll win there. We need a draw there, and we'll get a win here. And and it's all you know like a little kid, like a little kid. Do you know what I mean? It's like I don't think they'll win there if they don't win there. If they do, that's a bonus three points for them. And you know I have it planned all the way through the season and. I just thought we were, we were, us and Leicester were the top two teams at the time. I loved playing. I loved, I loved every, every week. And I've never played in front of fans like it. I, honestly, yeah. I mean, I played in front of great fans. Arsenal, Portsmouth, uh, Villa. Great fans, Middlesbrough. But Portsmouth, 19,000 people there. It was, felt like there was 100,000 people there. Yeah. Every week. Every week. Every week. I've ne- I, honestly, I've never... I mean, other other teams blow me away. Like the the home fans at Portsmouth were phenomenal. I mean, but I I played at Middlesbrough when we played Oxford away on a Tuesday night, and I virtually filled the whole away end. And you come out, and you go, wow, the whole away end. We just, I mean, that's what you call support. And Arsenal, when you know, used to go away. I mean, I was fortunate enough to play in front of, like, special fans. And I, I mean special fans. I'm not just saying it because I'm on here. I mean, we're going to talk about Middles Walsall in a minute, which is a bit different. But but with, with them fans, it was it was, it was was mind-blowing. You know, you don't realise how lucky you are when, when you play in front of good fans. It makes a difference. Yeah, we're almost out of time. But before we go, final question on how all of these managers, characters, how did they impact you when you made that transition? into management yourself at Warsaw? No. Nah. They didn't. <laughs> you try to. Of course you do. You try. Of course you do. You try, you try. You think I'll take a bit of that and a bit of that and a bit of that. I think the first and most important thing when you, when you want to become a top manager, you've got, you got to have thick skin. You, got to, you don't care if no one likes you. I yeah. mean, that's a, hard, that's a hard trait. Was that something? That's a hard trait. Yeah, that's that, a hard trait. With. For people to, to be a person that you don't care if everybody hates you. I mean, to be a successful manager, that's what you've got to be at first. You've got to be that. And that, 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 that was hard for me. I, I wanted to be everybody's friend. And yeah. that was my biggest regret in football is, is management. I, I, I always wanted to be a football manager from the age of about 28. But I got the Walsall job because I was at Walsall. 
you know, I wasn't at playing at Berry and Wolves will come for me and said, would you be our manager? I got it because it was convenient for them. And was these were my mates. Be- haven't played there. And they, were, they were my mates before the players were my mates. And they see that I wasn't a good trainer at the end. I was coming towards the end of my career. I didn't want to train. I just wanted to play football on a Saturday. And, and that was probably my biggest disappointment that I didn't, I couldn't cross that line. I couldn't cross that line. And I just wanted to be everybody's friend. And you, you can't be everybody's friend if you want to be a top manager. Lovely stuff, Merce. Thank you very much for your time and your first observation. Pleasure, Jack. Enjoy it. Yeah, I loved it. No problem. I thought a bit late asking. I mean, at the end, what is it? July? But <laughs> hey-o. <laughs> nice one. Thanks, Merce. Cheers, mate. Cheers.